<laughs> Tell these guys a story. Um, so uh, I was on the uh, uh, Wednesday call, and this week was was kind of a brutal week because Monday night um, there was a shooting at in the parking lot of one of the baseball fields where we have baseball games. Um, mm. Some teenagers rolled up, 845, and got in a fist fight, got in a shootout. This is, this is, we're, we're at this ball field twice a week. We weren't there this time, but just because of scheduling, we weren't, we would have been there if it had been on the schedule. And the, uh, I mean, it made front page news. Nobody was hurt. The teenagers could not hit the broadside of a barn, apparently, which is fortunate. Uh, nobody was hurt, you know, bullet holes in cars and everybody, you know, totally traumatized, but uh, you know, like like a mom had a, a phone on the chain link fence filming everything on the field. So then broadcasting into, you know, the app so that parents who can't be there in person can watch the game and everything. And, you know, watch. So the video, you can hear the gunshots and it's not like pop, 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 pop. It's like, you know, 15 round magazines being emptied at each other, 60 plus bullets at least. And. Tuesday is when I, I learned about it and I just kind of fell apart all afternoon crying off and on because, you know, nine, year, nine year old, this is nine year old baseball, John. So if anybody's ever watched a nine year old baseball game, it is a comedy of errors. They're not paying attention to anything. They're dancing in the outfield. You know, it's like, I cannot watch nine year old baseball, but then it's like fireworks going off. The adults realize what's going on. They start screaming. And all I can do is picture my nine-year-old son standing there at the plate like this nine-year-old boy was, just standing there looking around while everybody's screaming at him to drop and crawl to the dugout. <clears throat> so I was it, – it just hit me. You know, it's like this happened in my world, and I'm reacting to it. My emotions are reacting to it uh, because it's in my world. And I didn't, I didn't realize how hard it would hit me. Uh, my sister called it relief grief. And then yesterday morning, I was, you know, running on my treadmill and realized it's like, I, I, I am not able to function for the stuff that I need to function for today. So I called Jennings, my partner, and like, dude, you, you gotta, can you handle all the calls? You know, it's, it's, it's embarrassing. It feels embarrassing to ask. But it's not right. Like mentally, I know this is the right thing to do. So I did. And yesterday, just ran a half marathon on my treadmill and then hung out with the kids. We played Harry Potter, Battle for Hogwarts. And I rode my bicycle 10 miles and trained with my trainer for an hour and just tried to lean into the family instead of just curl up in a ball and cry all day. <laughs> so it was. It was an uh, unnerving experiencing it. I think I'm, you know, I'm good to, not, I'm not good to go. Uh, you know, half the parents are saying like, well, we're not going back to that ball field, period, hard stop, which I understand. Like, I, I'm not going to blame them for feeling that way. So it was a scary thing. And I, just leaning in was critical. And I was like, this stuff happens. And instead of just bottling it up and shoving it to the side and moving on, uh, had to let it process. That's intense, man. Hey, I'm curious because you mentioned something that I've, I've actually found surprising. So, you know, when I think of you, I think of you as, you know, in a guy in this group, I, I think of you as a guy who's always willing to not only help out, but lean in. Uh, you know, you're, you're obviously very open. Uh, you share a lot of what's going on. Uh, you participate a lot and you ask for help. And so what do you think it was that, you know, you mentioned that asking, either asking for help or saying you needed some time felt embarrassing to you, which I find actually quite surprising. Do you, can you say more about that? Um, my, my personality type, Enneagram type three, for those of you who are familiar with Enneagram, my, my, 
my internal fear is that of being worthless, not having value. So thinking, you know, processing is like, I feel like a failure since I can't pull my weight today. But I know that's not right because I do pull my weight. I pull more than my weight. And so even though, even though that, that feeling was there, it's like, I can't listen to this feeling. This, this feeling is not reality. Like I do pull my weight. It's not embarrassing. It's, it's okay for me to ask for help. So, uh, so that was the, that was the mental thought. I mean, it wasn't an internal struggle. It was just mm -hmm. like, gosh, you know, it doesn't feel real good saying that I need to take, because part of it is, you know, we weren't there. We weren't there. And I don't want somebody to like, well, it didn't even really affect you. Nobody was hurt. Nobody was injured. You know, you weren't there in person. So you, uh, what, you know, what's, what, why do you need to take a break? Like, I, I don't know why I need to take a break. I didn't think I would need to take a break, but I know I need to take a break. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, Jake, man, go ahead. Yeah, and I just want to say that, like, how mature and hard that is to do. And and then, and again, it's, I think, with, like, high achievers like us, um, you know, in this group, that it, it shows more strength recognizing that and going in. It's, it's like the, <clears throat> everybody wants that athlete or that person that's willing to grind, grind, grind. But then all of a sudden they break down. And you're done. It's like, hey, if you're training for a marathon and you want to run that extra three miles, well, what good is it if you run that extra three miles and then you stress fracture your foot and now you can't run for like mm -hmm. six weeks? And, and we think about that as a physical standpoint, but so many people don't have the emotional IQ to relate that to the mental standpoint, right? And being able to know, like, hey, when I need to break and, and step away from it, man. And that is a, I just want to commend you on, on such a huge shine, sign of maturity and of, of really knowing yourself, right. And, and knowing those, those limits of what you can and cannot do. Um, and I think that's something that all of us in this group can um, learn from, right. Because most of the time, what I, I notice in us is when we're not accomplishing something, it's because we're doing so much. Right, we're spread out so thin and doing so much that we don't have those key items really lined up. So I just wanted to commend that too, because that's nothing easy to do. Um, it, it takes a sign of maturity. It's the same thing. I had a sore throat today, so I didn't, I didn't wrestle today. I just went into the gym and did this little fucking PT shit that I wouldn't have ever counted as a workout 10 years ago, but today it counts as a workout, right? So yeah. To... Yeah, commend that. Larry. Yeah. Um, I apologize. I was a few minutes late. Um, and I, I caught the tail end of uh, but I, I messaged J Mac and he kind of caught me up on what you're talking about. Um, first of all, I mean, that is very scary stuff. And I'm not gonna say anything much different than what Jake did because I, I think it's beautiful that you listened to yourself and what you needed. And, and dude, like, listen, John, Eric, Garrett, the other John, beautiful, be beautiful blue eyes, John, um, Jay, Craig, David, and, and Steve. I mean, like, we all have issues with that. In fact, the, the people, the person that we usually listen to the most when we need to we'll listen to the least when we need a break is the one that stares at us in the mirror. In fact, I think most of us are probably guilty at times. Maybe we're in a season of it right now. We're, we're working so hard sometimes and we don't take that break that we are like digging our own demise in a way. And so I think I, I honor you and appreciate you for listening to yourself and taking like, I need a minute. And if I don't take this minute, then I am going to probably not be good for anybody. And sometimes you just need to reset I do have one question though, before we m move on, because I think it's something that you could like truly bless us with, you know, most of us, I mean, dude, I, um, I'll, I'll just share this really quick thing. Sometimes you look at life and, and your business and your kids and there's so much stuff going on and you're like, Oh my gosh, like there's so much and I'm so stressed out and like, God bless. Sometimes I feel like the world is crumbling. 
And then I've got this really good friend of mine. He's actually been on the podcast. He's here locally. His name's Matt, married to this beautiful woman named Maria. They have two kids and their, their daughter is five and their daughter has a terminal illness and she could literally go at any minute. And she's been that way since birth. She has this disease. I don't know what it is, but only 19 people in the entire world have it. And she's basically like, she can't really breathe on her own. You know, she's in a wheelchair right now. They're, they're trying to scramble to put together $125,000 so they can put an elevator in their house because she, they can no longer get her up the stairs. And I ran into Matt just the other day and I'm like, what the hell do I have to be stressed out about for God's sake, like get your act together. Right. So the question I have for you is experiencing something like that. And then looking through the lens of, yes, there's some sorrow, right? And there's like, oh my gosh, like that is scary stuff. But has how has it changed maybe some appreciation and some things you got going on in your life as you just look at things right now? You know, very much. Well, I, 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 it, was a, it was another nudge in the direction that I'm already moving. It's not like, oh, I just had a wake up call. And now the sky is bluer and the grass is greener. And I smell all the flowers because I've been working on moving in that direction steadily for years to where I, I focus con regularly on what really matters. Um, but it was, but, but you're, you are right that all of the stuff that I'm doing, the only reason I'm doing it is for my family and you know, tomorrow is not guaranteed. It's just not there. You, you, wrong place, wrong time. Just living life, doing your own thing. Uh, it's just not guaranteed. We, we, we always assume there will be tomorrow because there has always been tomorrow so far. And it's, it's very difficult to think through because you don't just don't feel like there's not going to be tomorrow until you're faced with a situation like this, like your friend, Matt is like, Oh, there really may not be a tomorrow. We just don't know very low odds, but somebody didn't wake up today that thought they would. And their family is, is wrecked is, is just, you know, they're an emotional wreck because something happened yesterday that they weren't expecting and they wish they could go back. And it's hard because we all have to do things to push life forward and make sure that things are okay for today and tomorrow. But, you know, you can't just focus everything 100% on, on the family because other things fall apart that, you know, support the family. But it is a huge reminder that the family is what is the reason why I do this. And there's no, there's no guarantee that, that they're going to be here tomorrow. And I love how, I love the entire message and especially how real you were at the very beginning talking about the grass and the flowers and all that. I mean, it could have been like, but I, I think how realistic you are and how, how you're looking at things through the lens of just such appreciation and, and seizing the, the present moment. Yeah, Cause you're right. I mean, <clears throat> you know, we, we could go to bed tonight and not wake up tomorrow and, you know, or somebody very close to us, same thing. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I just, I, I know this is probably not the, easiest thing in the world for you to talk about but thanks for for just blessing us with that perspective man especially with it being such a hard time for sure thank you guys this is actually an amazing segue into what we're going to talk about today um but i wanted to i wanted to point out one thing because uh you said you talked about the idea of relief grief and there's mm -hmm. one of the things i think we should like we should be aware of and i, I can remember learning this really powerfully is this there's this idea of ambiguous, it's called ambiguous grief. And what it means is when you're 
idea of how things are supposed to be or how they were going to be is shattered, right? So you're, you're emotionally attached to the fact up for obvious reasons that I take my kids to the baseball stadium and it's fucking safe or, or whatever. I'll give you an example from my personal life. I remember when, when Cindy first got sick, I mean, I just, I was so naive. I thought, well, we'll just take her to the psychiatrist a few times. She'll lay down on the couch and they'll fix her. Like that's li literally what I thought would happen. And after going to the psychiatrist a few times, uh, I was like, this fucking guy has no idea what he's doing. Like, like nobody knows anything. And I, what I realized is I don't think this is ever going to get better. And the process of grieving what I thought we had and what I, and the future I thought we were going to create was really fucking difficult man. because I had to let it go. Right. So there's a grief there. And I think for you too, the grief is you have this idea right of what it means to take your kids to the ball diamond and for it to be safe and you know uh and like the society which you live in and all these things right and i mean I'm sh it'll pass i'm sure but it's like it's a powerful thing man to have your illusions which they really are illusions right shattered right shattered like that so yeah it's just so it's a you know don't don't dismiss it like it, as it's a powerful emotion for sure right all right, guys. Well, hey, this is, again, this is actually a, a great, uh, like a perfect, ironically enough, it's like a perfect segue into uh, what we're going to talk about today. So uh, the guy, this really went over well with the guys in the Tuesday group. Uh, so I've been going down the rabbit hole on stoic philosophy, like getting all obsessed with it, like I do with everything else. And so uh, there's some really interesting ideas here, uh, you know, around what it is we can and can't control. And giving you, you know, creating some simple tools or, you know, showing some simple tools to actually get clear on that. So, Yaden, in your case, man, like, you know, sitting through, like going through an event like this, and, and I'm obviously you've done this to a certain extent, but, you know, really when there's something that happens or something that's happening that you don't like, uh, for whatever the reason, you know, it's very powerful to transfer that aversion, that feel, you know, that dislike, disgust. Uh, anger, whatever, into, you know, to, to transfer it from something external to something internal that you can control and actually do something about, right? So we're going to talk about that today. And we're going to like, we're going to do a live training today. So I'm going to spotlight my video here. And, uh, you know, we, we're calling it the energy focusing framework, because I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, we have, you know, a finite amount of uh, time and energy. And the question is, what do we need to do? to or how do we figure out where to focus that precious time and energy so that we can you know be the most effective and effective means lots of different things in lots of different situations okay so but ideally or fundamentally here like one of the principles is our idea is you can't calm the storm right the storm is happening a lot of times despite what you might want to do about it it's, it's not in your complete control Stop trying to calm the storm and calm yourself and recognizing, you know, recognize that the storm will pass. But while the storm is raging, what you have control over is what is in your mind. Okay. So that's, uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. And we'll give you some, you know, some quick training. We'll give you some uh, simple ideas. Uh, and then we'll give you some tools and give you some time in breakout rooms to actually work through some of the stuff. Okay. So why don't we get rolling here? So you know, the, I, the question is, you know, and this is really like this major part of stoic philosophy, they call it the dichotomy of control, right? And it's really about recognizing what, what is in your complete control, and what is, you know, in your partial, partial or, you know, incomplete control or no control at all. And it's very hard for us sometimes to differentiate between those two things, especially in the moment, right? Especially in a moment when things are challenging. So let's talk about, uh, like, let's talk about what happens if we don't do it, right? Like, let's, if we're not clear on what we can control, well, we spread our energy and our focus too thin, right? Because we're trying to control too many fucking variables. I've spent so much of my life trying to do this and it's just a fool's errand. Um, so, you know, again, we, we, we think of ourselves as captains of the universe and there's, we try to control everything and it's impossible. And so what happens is 
we like, spread our time and energy too thin, trying to focus things on things like not enough time on things we can control and too much time on things we can't fully control. Okay. And we're going to give you examples of all this stuff. So anxiety, right? Interestingly, I had this cool conversation with uh, Matthias about this. He can't be on the call today uh, about, he doesn't agree with this definition of anxiety. Uh, if you want to see more, we had a good discussion about it in Mighty Networks. But the point is that, you know, when you focus on things that you only have complete control of, it means we'll actually worry more for the same reason, because we know we don't have total control over it. So there's this uh, sense of uncertainty Anxiety, you know, fear. So I actually learned this in this conversation with Magnus. I actually did not know the difference between fear and anxiety. Fear is really being worried about a specific thing. An anxiety is like a generalized sense of worry or concern that's not directed at a specific thing, right? So, um, so we'll have more anxiety. Uh, we'll forfeit some of our happiness, right? Because, I think, you know, when you make your happiness dependent on the things uh, other people do or how external events turn out, you'll always find yourself willing give it, willingly giving it some of it away. So like an example would be, uh, I want to, let's say I play hockey, right? And I want to score a goal. It feels good to score a goal. Well, if I make my, my happiness dependent on scoring a goal, that's not in my complete control. No matter how well I show up, there's a whole bunch of other variables uh, that I can't control. But if I make my happiness dependent on, showing up and playing to the best of my ability and being the best teammate that I can, I own that. That is something I can absolutely do, right? So when you make your happiness dependent on things outside of your control, you're, you're always going to give yourself, like willingly give yourself, give some of that happiness away. Okay, a couple more ideas here. So unmet expectations. When you're waiting around expecting others to do something or things to turn out a certain way and you'll find they don't, uh, you'll, you'll find often that they don't, right? And all you really can control is how you think about things and how you respond, all right? So self-criticism. I mean, think about it. We're all type A overachievers who like to tell ourselves that th through our sheer fucking force of will that we can affect any outcome. But the truth is, like hardly, like when you think about it, hardly anything is totally dependent on us. So if we're living under this illusion that we have the power to make anything we want happen, when it doesn't go that way, there's only one person to blame, and that's us, right? And it's not that there's not, you know, some reflection required. I'm not suggesting that at all. It's just that, you know, again, there's things we can control, and there's things that we can't, or that we don't have full control over. So we're going to go into some details about that in a minute. And like, ultimately, this all leads to, can lead to a sense of dissatisfaction. I mean, think about it, right? Spreading yourself too thin, you're feeling anxious, you know, you know, you're giving away some of your happiness, you're finding yourself with unmet expectations and self-criticism. That's not going to lead typically to, uh, you know, a full sense of, you know, satisfaction and fulfillment, right? So these are some of the things that can happen if we spend time focusing too much on things we don't have total control over. And if you guys, anything, I'll, I'll pause for after this next bit here for any questions. If there's anything in here that I'm saying uh, that you think is bullshit or you, know, you have any questions about, just call it out, right? Because our goal here is to, like for me, I mean, I'm learning about this stuff and like, my, my thinking is what the best way to learn is to teach it to you guys. So if there's something you have a question about, I might not know the answer. I'm certainly not an expert on this, uh, but I'm finding it really helpful. So any of your questions you have will actually help me uh, learn more and be able to teach it in a more effective way. So feel free to jump in at any point. So what do we want? Okay. What do we want? Well, we want serenity, right? Like, and, and the serenity prayer basically just sums it up, right? God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And there's a peace and calm that knows, that comes from knowing uh, what depends only on you and what doesn't. And that's another way to think about the idea of the dichotomy of control, right? Is it's either what you control or what's in your, you know, in your complete control or your partial control. Another way to think of it is what is it that depends on you? Like on only you. And the reason I, I, I like that distinction is because I think sometimes we, if we think about control and 
full control and partial control, we can kind of beat ourselves up a bit. Like, so I'll give you an example. Let's say, let's say you have some deep seated pattern, right? Like, I mean, I don't know, it could be something going back to your childhood, right? Where it's like, where it, you know, that causes you to, maybe someone was horrible to you when you were a kid and therefore you have uh, an angry reaction in certain situations. Right. Like, like, I don't know, maybe your mom was really bad to you. And then when your wife says something critical of you, it causes you to have a reaction. Right. And so there's some shit that needs to be done there. There's some work that needs to be done there. And so the idea here is like, if you frame it as, you know, control, like the Stoics frame it as control and incomplete control, you can almost beat yourself up because it almost sounds like you should be able to flip a switch and say, okay, you know what, for now on, I'm never going to be triggered by that. I am in control. I mean, come on, it's not that simple, right? So another way to think of it is my anger and my reaction depends only on me. It's not about the other person because, you know, somebody else could say the exact same thing to another person and they'd be fine with it. So it depends on me, which just really talk, you know, I think makes it more clear that there, I have work to do here and I am the only one that can do it. Okay, so you can either think of it as control or partial control, or you can think of the idea of control as something that depends only on me. Okay, uh, laser clarity. So what do we want? We want clarity, man. We want to know where the best place to focus our time and energy is, our time, our precious time and energy. And we want leverage. We're all business owners here. We're all about leverage. We're all about, you know, taking the action that will produce the highest return, right? With a minimal, like with a minimal amount of energy. Uh, so we want a high return on our efforts when it comes to calm, happiness, and effectiveness, right? So we want to make sure we're focusing on the right things to produce the best return. So we want systems and processes, right? So we want some uh, simple tools. So we want some simple tools uh, to be able to refocus our time and energy quickly. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to give you a couple of tools that you can use right now. Okay. We want resilience. Like knowing, like, so our beliefs, think of it this way. There's this uh, Stoic philosopher, his name is Epictetus, Epictetus. And what he talks, what he talks about is it's not events that upset us, but rather our opinions about them. It's not events that upset us. It's our opinions about those events. Okay. So our beliefs fuel our emotions, right? So if we get attached to certain outcomes that we don't have complete control over, that can cause us some pain, you know, like some emotional uh, difficulties, let's say. But if we recognize that, you know what, this might not turn out the way I want. And ultimately what matters is that I learn from it and I you know, I step up, I learn, I admit my mistakes or whatever. Those beliefs are going to fuel a different set of emotions when something doesn't go the way you want it. And that's what resilience is really all about. Okay. So we want resilience. We want, you know, ultimately uh, emotional invincibility, right? So Seneca, another stoic philosopher says to bear trials with a calm mind robs misfortune of its strength to bear trials with a calm mind bears, uh, sorry, to bear trials of the calm mind robs misfortune of its strength. It's pretty powerful, right? So, and that's where invincibility lies. You can't be upset by anything outside of your control. You choose your reaction to whatever happens. You choose not to be harmed. If like, ultimately, if you choose to, you can shrug off every finger, like every time somebody gives you a finger, every bad word and every attack that's directed you with patience and humor. Nothing can harm you if you don't let it. So if that's the case, then how can you not be invincible, right? So these are the things we want. We want, you know, we want serenity, clarity, leverage. We want uh, simple systems and processes to help us. Uh, we want resilience. And like, ultimately we want emotional invincibility so we can face down any situation as our best self and able to let, you know, focus on what it is that we have control over, and let, the, let the rest, the attachment to the rest go. Okay. So like, ultimately, if somebody wants to be an out, like act like an asshole, we don't have to, we don't have control over it. Right. So, but we do have control over the choice 
of how we choose to look at that situation. So those are some of the concepts, what we don't, what we do want, what we don't want. I'm going to stop there before we get into uh, some of the, some of the uh, ideas and a couple of tools. Anybody have any thoughts, questions, comments, confusion about that? Anything you like, you know, vehemently disagree with? All right. Again, you can stop me anytime. So three big ideas here. So some things depend on you. Some things don't. Okay, just like we talked about earlier, right? Focus on the things that depend only on you, which is basically how you think about things, you know, your reactions to them, etc. cetera. Insource your happiness, right? Remember we talked about the idea, if you make your happiness about uh, attached to the outcomes of things you don't have total control over, what you're going to find is your happiness. You're willingly give it away. When you make it so that you're focused, your happiness is focused on things that you can control, then you will, uh, you will find yourself happy a lot more often. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples from my own personal life here, because as I've been working through some of this stuff and lastly, transfer external to internal. So we're going to do an exercise on this uh, coming up uh, shortly here. But again, the idea here is when you are seeing something that you don't have complete control over that you don't like, right? Usually what we can do is we can focus on the thing we don't like rather than transferring that you know, partial or no control over an external thing, transferring the control internal. So like saying, okay, I don't like this thing. What, however, what is it in this situation that is actually in my control right now? So when you do that, it's very, very empowering. It's very enlightening. Uh, and it's very, very empowering because you've just taken something that you have limited power over and you've kind of transferred it to something that you have total power and control over and can do something about. Okay. And so we're going to give you guys, again, we're going to give you guys an exercise to do this that I think you'll find pretty, uh, pretty illuminating. All right. So let's talk about, oh, I still, uh, I forgot to erase all these. Bear with me for a second here. Here's my eraser. All right, so let's think of it this way. Okay, there's this quadrant I like to draw here. Okay, and the idea here is there's two dimensions or two, two axes. You know, you can see at the top of the vertical one, focus on top, ignore at the bottom, uh, and then can't control and can control along the horizontal axis. So if you're operating down in this quadrant here, which is I'm ignoring what I can't control. So let's actually, let's be, be really clear about something here, okay? It, you need to be, it's, it's not about being like just ignoring everything you can't control, right? You should still be aware of things control. You should just be discerning enough to be able to talk about the difference. Right. So it's like you shouldn't ex ignore external factors. You should educate yourself about them and then accept what is and be aware of the external conditions that are outside of your control. So, like COVID is an example, right? Like it's not that I'm just going to put my head in the sand and pretend that COVID is not a thing and then just, you know, ultimately end up listening to everybody bombard me with all their opinions about COVID without educating myself about it. Right. Because if you do that, where you end up is you end up being paranoid. So you have no idea what's going on around you. The, the path is to, you know, educate yourself, obviously, about COVID and then make the decisions that you have control over and focus on those things. Uh, and that's where you'll get what you want. But if you're just ignoring not everything that's not within your control, you're going to find that you end up getting paranoid because, again, you're not taking in the information uh, in a way that serves you. You're going to be really uh, beholden to the barrage of conflicting information and opinions and points of view and fucking agendas that everybody else has. So you got to think for yourself and really ultimately discerning what you can and can't control starts with educating yourself about what's going on. Okay. So if you can't control it, and you're ignoring it. You're going to find you end up paranoid. 
If you're ignoring, if you're focusing on what you can't control, which is this quadrant up, up here, if you do that, you're just wasting energy. If you're focused on what you can't control, you're wasting energy. Uh, you're just focusing on things that are not gonna move you forward. Now, if you're down here, what's happening? Well, you're ignoring things that you can control. Here, you're wasting opportunities. Right. So it, it, because, you know, one of the things about about stoicism, they, they talk a lot about logic and rationality. Uh, in this case, if you're ignoring things you can control, you're being unreasonable uh, from their point of view. Right. So we think of this as wasting opportunities. And then up here in this quadrant, this is where we want to be. Right. We're focused. and Effective. Effective, just simply meaning that, you know, we're able to produce uh, the result that we want to produce. And so when you're focusing on what's within your control, you're in the driver's seat. You're being intentional about your attitude and how you spend your energy. So just, you know, recognize there's kind of four ways of thinking about this. And obviously we want to spend as much time as possible up in the top right-hand corner. And we want to be able to, we want to make sure that we are taking the information in that we need, like being educated, being aware, uh, you know, being involved, citizens, etc., so that we can discern how to get from these three other quadrants to here, because we spend time in all of them, right? We absolutely spend time in all of these quadrants. And so we want to you make sure we have the, the awareness and the tools to move from wherever we happen to be up into the top into the top right-hand quadrant, okay? So that's kind of the control focus quadrant. And then the last main idea here is this, these spheres of control. So I've been talking a lot about, I'm talking a lot about um, what we can control and what we can't control over. And it's basically like this. What's in your control is your judgments and opinions. The, you know, the judgments and opinions we apply to situations, okay? Number two is what we decide to, uh, like our, basically our impulses. Or another way of saying that is what we choose to pursue or go after or not pursue. And then three is whether we take action. basically it that is basically the only things that are in our control okay and and you'll notice that uh for the most part there are, there are things in our they're all in our mind right they're all in our mind uh i i would say there's some debate on whether we uh whether we taking action is in our control choosing to take action is probably a better way of saying that uh but regardless you know these are these are three things so the judgments we apply to situations like our judgments and opinions, our impulses. So what we decide like to move toward or move away from and whether we take action in a given situation. What are you not in control, complete control of over? Your body. You can try to be as healthy as possible and you could still be struck down with a debilitating illness or be fucking hit by a car or, you know, have somebody assault you uh, or whatever, right? So do you have some control? Sure. Do you have complete control? No. So if you make, if you're, you know, lots of us here are super fit, you know, uh, I'm sure part of our identity is being that way. And if we make our happiness dependent on being a six pack or having a certain resting heart rate and fucking something happens and we don't have it, that's going to be a major problem, man. Right. That's going to be a major, major problem. Property. We get attached to our things, our nice houses, or whatever, it could all be taken away, man. It could all be taken away. The market could crash. The government could fucking, you know, implement some policy that damages you. Uh, you know, we could be become unable to work. Uh, you know, anything could happen that we could lose that property. Another one is reputation. 
look at that whole like i mean i'm not really following it my daughter was giving me this whole spiel on it that uh johnny depp thing you know like falsely accused of or at least it sounds like falsely accused of like being an abuser right so it looks like it wasn't true look what happened to him reputation smeared lost his contract to be like in the pirates of caribbeans lost millions of dollars right and so you never know what is going to happen anything could happen anybody could make you could you could make a terrible mistake uh even with your best intentions it harms somebody else harms your reputation uh somebody might fucking have something you know have it out have it in for you for some reason uh you know a former a former spouse a you know disgruntled business partner anybody you know uh you don't have total control over it so we all want to have a good reputation right but really what's in our control is choosing how we show up in every situation the ultimate result of that we can't we don't have complete control over and then lastly it's the results of our actions we have some control sure but we don't have complete control over them. So how many times have you been in a situation where we've taken an action that didn't turn out the way we want? Everybody, that's, everybody has been in that situation, right? So um, ultimately we can't control the results of our actions. So again, it's the idea of like playing hockey, right? I can show up and I can be the best player, the best teammate and do my, like, do my very best to play the best to my ability. That's it. That's all I can do. That does not mean that that's going to result in me scoring, the team winning, any of those things, right? So the, 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 the place you want to think about is the first part, not the whether you get a goal or not. And then basically five is anything not in the first circle. So for example, You know, I, I think uh, I'm thinking of Yaden here, right? So, you know, let's say Yaden's commitment to protect his children is something that he has complete control over. His commitment to protect his children. The outcome, he does not have complete control over. So he might say, you know what? I am so committed to protecting my children uh, that I'm going to, like, I don't... I, I no longer think it's safe to go to this baseball diamond. So I'm going to research and I'm going to like take them to a baseball diamond with better security. For example, I'm, I'm just totally making this up as I go along here or, or in a different part of town or whatever. And that way I'll, you know, I'll keep them safe and you could get in a car accident on the way over there or some other nut bar might show up at that. I mean, you just don't have control over, it, right? What you have control over is your sense of commitment and your, your willingness and ability to do your very best to keep your children safe, okay? So those are some of the main concepts. So I'll pause there for a sec, uh, and then we're going to uh, give you a couple of exercises to do. One I'll just run through, and then one what I'll get you to do is I'll get you guys to move into breakout rooms and we'll uh, get you to work on some things together. So having said all that, anybody have any like questions you want some clarity on that I could maybe help with or somebody else on the call could help with or is anything not, uh, you know, not making sense or is it all pretty straightforward? <laughs>